So you are on your healing journey. You've dealt with a lot of church wounds. You've dealt with a lot of church hurts, let alone everything else that was going on in life. You had relationship hurt, family hurt, and trauma all around, and you trusted the church to be a safe space for you to heal, a safe space for you to grow in a relationship with Christ. But unfortunately for you and for many of us, that wasn't always the case. You ended up dealing with a lot of abuse, a lot of hurt, a lot of church trauma that actually left you more wounded than when you came in. It left you questioning whether or not you should even pursue a relationship with Christ. Trust me, I've been there. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about some of the mindset shifts that I had to go through in order to actually deepen my relationship with Christ and not allow the church hurt dictate the relationship that I would have with my creator. back to Benny Steak. I'm your girl Benny and just like the title says today we're going to be diving deeper into healing from church wounds. When I tell you I did not expect my other video to do as well as it did. So many people messaged me, DM'd me. I shared the same video even on TikTok and it also just got a lot of you know conversations, a lot of people agreeing, a lot of people sharing their stories and just how they had to deal and heal from a lot of the church hurt a lot of these uh, misunderstandings, a lot of these ideas around God that were actually not true. So today we're actually going to be talking about some of the mindset shifts that I had to go through to deal with a lot of the church hurt, a lot of the church abuse. We're really just going to call it that because a lot of us, if we're being honest, we've gone through a lot of things in a place that we should not have been going through those things. I was hanging out with a couple friends and there was a preaching on the tv and this preacher this is a prominent preacher i'm not going to mention their names but this prominent preacher went ahead and said that women's identity is tied to them being married while men's identities is tied to them being providers and successful in their fields as the video progressed i understood the general sentiment of what he was trying to say but i just could not shake the word identity being attached to women being married. Now, I'm not a man, so I ain't gonna say what men are doing. I'm not gonna speak from the experiences because I'm only able to speak from my experiences as a woman. And as a woman, it really saddens me to see how much the church has put a lot of emphasis, a lot of idolization, a lot of idolizing, is it idolization? But the church be idolizing marriages in a way that is very unhealthy and problematic. So to have this preacher, and he's a very prominent preacher, who went ahead and said that women's identities is tied to them being married, I just, it did not sit well with me because I don't think that goes with the heart of God for us. I just don't think so. What I would have preferred be used was the word socialize. Because I believe that, yes, the two genders are socialized differently. Women are socialized to seek marriages, to seek partners, to tend to the home, to make sure that they're presentable and appearing as desirable for the gaze of men. That's how women are socialized from such a young age. An easy example of this is you see the toys that they give little girls versus the toys that they give little boys. It's very different. I have noticed that boy toys tend to be a lot more fun, a lot more adventurous, a lot more out there. Whereas you have young girls playing with little kitchenettes, with dolls, pretending to be mothers, pretending that they're couples, all the Barbies and everything in between. It really does suggest from such a young age that young women or women in general are socialized to seek marriages and to seek partners. The reason why I strongly disagree with the word identity, because you mean to tell me, if I'm not married, then do I not have an identity? You know what I'm saying? If I was married and something happened to that relationship or something happened with my partner, or whatever the case is, if my status in relationship changes, does that mean, one, I don't have an identity, or does that mean I lose it? And more and more, we're seeing women who are getting married late in life. Does that mean they do not have an identity? That thought process already is just like not fully complete to me. So then I got curious, has there ever been a study 
where two young women raised in different parts of the world, one is raised and socialized to seek marriage and to seek family and to value husbands and partners, whereas one is just left to essentially decide what they want their lives to look like. If there has been an experiment done like that, I'm curious as to what the findings would be. As a child of God, my identity first and foremost is tied to Christ. My identity first and foremost is connected to me being a child of God. That's the biggest flex of my life. That will always be the biggest flex of my life. Now I'm a wife, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter. I'm a lot of these things. I have careers, I have ambitions, I have talents. But more than anything, I am a child of God first and foremost. So when you have prominent preachers on the pulpit literally saying that young women's values are attached to them being married for the women who do not have that or for the women who do not desire that. Do you see what that could do to them? For you to feel as though you would never arrive, that you haven't yet arrived or that you're not enough, in enough just like being yourself. Do you see what the hurt that could do? And this is one example. There are so many examples where we see, say an example, a young woman gets pregnant in the church. They will get set down while the men that got them pregnant will continue carrying on about their lives and everybody will shame her. Everybody will make her feel as though she's not enough, that she's not valuable, that somehow she is less than. These are things that are happening within the church. These are things that are happening within the church. I knew a girl way back when who got pregnant and literally she wasn't even allowed to sing in the choir anymore. Now, mind you, the person that got her pregnant was the drama. And guess what? He continued playing. We had a, I had another preacher that I saw on TikTok who was essentially having a conference charging young women about like 600 and some change dollars, talking about she's going to teach them how to be wives, how to be, you know, better prepared to receive their husbands. And so you have all these messagings that keeps emphasizing to women that unless they have a partner, unless they have a man, or unless they have a husband, that somehow they're not enough. And this is coming from male preachers, this is coming from female preachers, the over-sexualizing of women's bodies within the church. So many of us were told we're too fast. So many of us were harassed in church for the clothing that we wore. So many of us were harassed in church for the body types that we did have. Because sometimes the woman is not trying to be provocative. Sometimes she just has big boobs. Sometimes she just has a big booty. Sometimes women are just trying to exist without being constantly reminded that the existence is somehow attached to the male gaze or to them securing a man or to them securing a husband. And this rhetoric is so prevalent, so prevalent within the church. I've been harassed in so many ways as to how I was dressing. In the previous church that I used to go to, it was like every other Sunday I would be called on the side or my skirt was too short or that, you know, my skirt was too tight. But if I'm coming to see God, I'm coming to see God and I should not be harassed for the way that I dress, whether or not I have a partner or have somebody tie my value and somebody tie my identity to having a husband. Because let's keep it a buck. Mary was not married when she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus. She was not. She was not married. It was in her single season that she was chosen to carry one of the greatest weight that this world will ever know. To carry the greatest story, the greatest man that this world would ever know. She was single. It was in her single season. She was yet to be married to, uh, to Joseph. She was still single. Jesus himself, the greatest example of who we are to be. Jesus himself was single. So all that was background for you to understand some of the things that I've seen, some of the things that I've personally experienced. Now, what are some of the mindset shifts that I had to go through in order to actually overcome this? Number one, I had to remember that God is not like men. God is not like men, which means some of the ideas that people share and some of the ideas that people embody do not necessarily have to be the ideas, the values, and the beliefs that God has for me. And so the practices that I began to put in place was reading the Bible for myself and reading the Bible within proper context. Because a lot of people will get on the pulpit, what the Bible said, the Bible said, did it say? And if it did say, 
what was the time frame in which it was said? What was the context in which it was said? What was the society like when that was written? What is the actual heart of God and not just the opinion of men? Open the Bible and read it for yourself. That's the number one thing I had to realize. God is not like men. If somebody is saying something that doesn't feel aligned with the spirit of God that lives within you, Go back to God and ask him. The second mindset shift that I had to go through was to remember that you can desire without idolizing. I'm not saying women shouldn't desire marriages. I'm not saying anybody shouldn't desire marriages. All I'm saying is that your identity should not be tied to that. Because the minute your identity is tied to that, that then becomes an idol. And once something becomes an idol, it's literally occupying the space that God is supposed to occupy. That goes from marriages, that goes from money, that goes from anything that you desire in this life because if anything is replacing the place that god is supposed to occupy something is off in my last video i talk about how we were created for god's glory everything that we do our entire being should glorify god if money becomes an obstacle to you glorifying god that's an idol if desiring a relationship you wanting a man or you wanting a wife become so important to you that you no longer are able to glorify God because you're so fixated on thinking of, I want a husband, I want a husband, and I want a husband. That's a problem because you're idolizing a thing. You can desire marriages. You can desire having a partner. I believe that it was God's intention for us to not be alone. God designed for us to be in community. But that should not trump. That should not trump his space. And tying it back again to the church hurt. The church, when it comes to marriage, the church has idolized marriages for young women so much so that it is so problematic. And so if you grew up in an environment where that was always the rhetoric, that you were not enough unless you had a husband, you were not enough unless you were married, you were not enough unless you were able to produce kids, you were not enough unless you had somebody, I'm here to remind you, beloved, that you can desire all those things without making it an idol. You can heal from that. The woman at the well, in my opinion, in my understanding, was that she fell victim of the very same thing that we're talking about. This idea that she was only valuable if she had a partner, that she was only valuable if she had a husband. Because our good says she wasn't satisfied. The text alludes to that, that she wasn't satisfied with anything. People came in and out of her life and she wasn't satisfied until Jesus came and gave her the water so that she will not thirst again. And no matter who you have in your life, if you're starting it from a place of brokenness, if you're starting it from a place of attaching your identity in that thing, you will continue to thirst for the rest of your life until you allow Jesus to actually quench your thirst. The third mindset shift that I had to go through was that if you do not work on actually identifying who you are, your worth, your value, your identity, if you don't work on it, what can happen is that people will come and tell you who you are, People can come and tell you what to value. And before you know it, you would have actually missed your whole life. Just wandering around, walking around people pleasing everybody. If you're going into a relationship without an identity, guess what? Your partner is going to tell you who you are. And that may or may not align with the heart of God. You need to define that for yourself. You need to heal for yourself. I'm going to go ahead and end this video right here. If it blessed you, please go ahead and like it, share, subscribe, comment. Do all of those things. This is something that I'm very passionate about, if you can tell. Because especially as a young black woman, as a young African woman, the ideas of marriage being your identity is almost on steroids. So much so that you cannot even escape it. I know families and I know of stories of young girls who were not even allowed to go to school because ultimately they were just supposed to get married. What's the point in educating them? These are the things that were backed by church preachings. So I'm very passionate about this. I could sit here and talk about this all day. But please, please, please remember your healing is your responsibility. And while you're healing, go to therapy, do all that stuff. But do not forget Jesus. If therapy is the medication, Jesus still is the healer. So take it up to Jesus. Talk about him. God is not like men. The word of God does not back everything that was said to you on the pulpit so go back to the word go back to the word and test it question question it's okay to question god the bible says he who lacks understanding let him ask you asking questions that's you questioning you can question god is not so you know what i'm saying that like god is not so fragile that he cannot handle our questions you can ask him questions i don't understand 
they said this i don't understand i disagree what am i missing is it is it me am i supposed to learn something or is what they're saying not true you can ask you know what i'm saying so let me go ahead and let y'all go please go ahead and subscribe do all of the things and i'm gonna go ahead and see you on the next one bye z's mm -hmm.